right with the world. Jay and Margo are back now, and uh, I know you guys are freezing, but we're delighted to have you back home. And our college kids are coming back home, amen? And uh, somebody bought a car on his own, right, Cooper? Man, that was pretty impressive. Didn't even need mom and dad's co-signature, did you? That is amazing. So ask him how he did it, those of you who might be coming along behind him, amen? As we have opportunity to worship the Lord, may we rise as we prepare our hearts. As Brenda prayed a little bit earlier, it's raining very lightly outside. So this is an opportunity for us to have our hearts cleansed as we enter into the presence of the Lord, to be receptive to all that God is going to do, has done, and will do in our lives. We gather this morning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of God's most precious Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, every desire known, and from whom no secrets can be kept hidden, we pray that you would cleanse the thoughts of each of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit. Help us to perfectly love you and to worthily magnify your holy name through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Brothers and sisters, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not with us. But when we're willing to confess, God who is both faithful and just will forgive, not some, forgive every sin, cleansing us from all unrighteousness. May we go before the Lord in fervent prayer. And you may remain standing, be seated, whatever your preference would be. Most merciful and forgiving God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Sisters and brothers, it was in the mercy of Almighty God that Jesus Christ was given to die for every single one of you. And for his sake, God forgives us every sin. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he grants us the power to become his children. And as we seek him, he freely bestows the gift of his spirit. May it be so for each one of us, to the glory of Christ. Amen. Well, Mary, you did it again. You selected one of my favorite hymns. Beautiful Savior, please rise.
and honor, praise, adoration, now and forevermore be thine. Please pray with me. Gracious Lord, you've gathered your people together today. We thank you for the privilege of honoring those people who have mentored us so powerfully. Mothers, grandmothers, aunts, mentors, surrogate mothers, those individuals who wanted to make sure that we not only received the faith, but would become witnesses of the same thereof. Bless all of them, Lord, in a mighty, mighty way. Those who are with us, and those who are already sharing in the saints triumphant gathered around the throne of our Lord in mercy. We thank and praise you, Lord. In your most precious name, all of God's children say, Amen. You may be seated. Whoever's working sound can throttle me down a little bit because I'm going to walk around and want to make sure that I have this on. Otherwise, Mary will upbraid me when she sees the video. Amen. She's done that regularly. You listening, Mary? You will be. She will be. She'll be listening. Well, all of you have heard me say that Easter's a season, so I have more eggs, right? This is the sixth Sunday of Easter, right? So Easter's a season. I love to tell people that, particularly those who are in bereavement, because the Easter season is parabolic it's uh, a foretaste of what we're going to experience when we're all together again in heaven and so we celebrate the resurrection and all of the characters that we've been looking at and what that means as we press forward toward ascension sunday when jesus was raised actually ascension thursday and then jesus was after raised appeared to his disciples poured out the spirit did mighty things Today, because we're honoring women in our lives who've done great things, I'm going to give uh, some of you Easter eggs to give to the women in your lives that you love and care for. So I'll give you two each, and you can decide to do with the second one what you will, but you might want to give them away, right? And let's see here who I can give these to. Now you guys are kind of busy up here, our faithful acolytes. So I don't I made sure this one didn't have a hole. You are welcome, ladies. Let's see who else we have here. Some fine young gentlemen. I know another mom that's going to have a lot of eggs. You guys look like cowboys with your uh, scarves there. You know that? Yeah. Let's see. Laura. You're not too old to get an egg, huh? I know another mom who might get a lot of eggs, or maybe Grandma will get in on some of the action. So keep one and give one away if you want. Amen. Let's see, do we have anybody up in the balcony? Huh? Who did? Okay, I'm going to let you deliver some to Patrick. I've been pretty good at throwing them up there, but I don't want to press my luck on this particular occasion. Amen? Yeah. Patrick, good man. All right. So remember, if you forget everything else that I've said, young men and women, Easter is a season, and we are ambassadors for the good news of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Now, if any of you older folks out there want some eggs that you can share with the women in your lives i'm going to leave them up here because i don't really want to have any more eggs now amen okay ralph i'll turn it over to you
morning and happy Mother's Day. Um, the flowers in the chancel are from a memorial service of our dear friend Ruth Myers. Um, the other announcements, most of them you can read on your own. Uh, still want to mention the cemetery mowing. It keeps raining, so it's going to keep growing. So, um, and we're trying to keep the cost down. So, if you can sign up and have time to do that, we sure will appreciate that. And the mission of the month is the Manchester Food Pantry. And uh, there's some other meetings that are scheduled for the later part of this month. You can read them on your own. Any other uh, announcements? Okay, we'll go right to the birthdays. We have Dan and Julie Shibley's birthday this week and Olivia Martin. Anyone else? Okay, we got Dan and Julie and Olivia. Birthday. Dan and Julie, how did you guys work it out that your birthdays were so close together? That's an amazing thing, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It helps you to remember not to forget, right? A great Easter psalm is Psalm 98. And so you can just meditate in your spirits as I share Psalm 98. Maybe focusing on a particular phrase or word that the Lord will give you as a gift. And then when we're praying a little bit later, then you can thank the Lord for whatever he revealed in the reading of his word. I had to uh, get through 69 years of my life before I learned this particular insight that is such a precious one now. Sing a new song to the Lord who has done marvelous things, whose right hand and holy arm have won the victory. O oh Lord, you have made known your victory. You have revealed your righteousness in the sight of the nations. You remember your steadfast love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the victory of our God. Shout with joy to the Lord, all you lands. Lift up your voice, rejoice and sing. Sing to the Lord with the harp, with the harp and the voice of song. With trumpets and the sound of the horn, the shout, shout with joy before the King, the Lord. And to let the sea roar and all that fills it, the world and those who dwell therein. Let the rivers clap their hands and let the hills ring out with joy before the Lord who comes to judge the earth. The Lord will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with equity. May God add a rich blessing to the reading of his word. So I think it's been a number of years since I shared the following, but I wanted to share it again today because I think it's most appropriate. It's been at least three. What love means to four and eight year olds from four, from ages four to eight years of age. And the, this fits in well with the text where Jesus tells us to love one another so that our joy may be full. What love means to four to eight year old. One young person wrote, when my grandmother got arthritis, she couldn't bend over and paint her toes anymore. So my grandfather does it for her all the time, even when his hands got arthritis too. That's love, Rebecca, age eight. When someone loves you, the way they say your name is different you know you just know that your name is safe in their mouth margie age four what wisdom amen love is when a girl puts on perfume and a boy puts on shaving cologne and they go out and smell each other <laughs> carl age five leave it to a young boy right love is what makes you smile when you're tired Terry, age four. 
Love is what's in the room with you at Christmas if you stop opening presents and just listen. Bobby, age seven. If you want to learn to love better, you should start with a friend who you hate. Wow. Nikki, age six. Love is when you tell a guy you like his shirt and then he wears it every day. Noel, age seven. Love is like a little old woman and a little old man who are still friends even after they know each other so well. Tommy, age six. During my piano recital, I was on a stage and I was scared. I looked at all the people watching me and saw my grandma waving and smiling. She was the only one doing that and I wasn't scared anymore. Cindy, age eight. So if you go to one of your grandkids' performances, ladies and gentlemen, wave and smile because that may relieve them of their anxiety, amen? My mommy loves me more than anybody. You don't see anyone else kissing me to sleep at night. Claire, age six. You really shouldn't say I love you unless you mean it, but if you mean it, you should say it a lot because people forget. Jessica, age eight. Not you, Jessica, but another Jessica, age eight. Those are priceless because out of the uh, wisdom of children come great wisdom sometimes. Jesus said, let the children come to me for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Amen? And we're all kingdom children. Please rise as you're able for the reading of the Holy Gospel. John chapter 15, verses 9 and following. Jesus said, as the Father has loved me, so I love you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. And this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, than to lay down one's life for one's friends. And you are my friends. If you do what I command you, I do not call you servants any longer because the servant does not know what the master is doing, but I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my father. You did not choose me, but I chose you and I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last so that the father will give you whatever you ask in my name. I am giving you these commands so that you may love one another. May God add a rich blessing to the reading of his holy word. You may be seated. So I've got three sermons today. Now I'm not going to have like three sermons back to back so that you're here all afternoon, but I have three themes that I couldn't escape this week. So I'll touch on all of them. Going back through this, I'd like to just do a little study of John 15. It's one of my favorite verses and uh, in my uh, chapel time online this week, it's the word that I focused on Thursday evening when uh, I broadcast to all of my classmates. Verse 12, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Jesus didn't give us a list of things not to do or to do, except he told his disciples just before he departed the earth. This is my commandment, that you love one another. Three types of love. Eros, which is romantic love. We get the word erotic from that in English. Philos, which is brotherly love. We get the word Philadelphia from that, the city of brotherly love. And agape love, self-giving love. The kind of love where a man who has an inability to, uh, to really paint his wife's toes does it anyway. That is agape love. Jesus goes on in verse 13 to say, No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. That's the supreme test of agape love. That you're willing to lay your life down as Jesus did. So if somebody burst through the door and uh, wanted to shoot all of us, Gordon, it would be your job to cover Carol and vice versa. It would be our job to look out for one another. 
God forbid that should ever happen, but it certainly happened in churches in our country way too many times and in other places. No one has greater love than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. And notice it doesn't say, this is my commandment, that you critique one another. Amen? So easy for us to critique one another. Now there are times that we have to be judgmental and judicious, but I think uh, all of us have that temptation to critique other people, and that's not our job. Our job is to extend ourselves one to another. Dropping down to another phrase here that caught my attention, I underlined it. But I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything that I heard from my father. Jesus got marching orders from his heavenly father and he decided to reveal that to us. The greatest commandment is love. But I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my father. So we're not servants anymore, we're friends. We're friends of Jesus and maybe that's why the Quakers always call themselves a society of friends because we are friends of the living Lord. He wants to be intimate with us. He wants us to, uh, to hear from him, not only on Sundays, but maybe in the evening hours, if you're a night owl, or in the early hours of the morning to get our marching orders from the Lord because we are his friends. You did not choose me, but I chose you and I appointed to go. I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. The only thing that lasts in this life are relationships. And all of us have loved ones that we won't see for a season, but the relationship is still intact. Amen? Relationship's still there. And one day as we cling to the promises of God, we'll be reunited with those women in our lives in particular who've been so instrumental in our lives. Wow, what a wonderful thing. Amen. I knew Linda's mother, Betty. Amen. And it's a wonderful thing when we know those individuals are still in relationship with us even when we don't see them with our earthly eyes. We can feel them in our heavenly hearts. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you to go and bear fruit. So the fruit that will last are our relationships one with another and that's why a church relationship is so important for the family of God for the women who've never born children oftentimes they are the mentors of other children that they consider their own right Betty right Betty Betty's got kids she's got a lot of kids Betty is a mother surrogate mother and I pick on her because I know she'll get even with me amen many times we have mentor mothers I think I've told you before I had a mentor mother Ann Turner who's gone on to be with the Lord she and her husband owned a mom-and-pop motel where businessmen stayed and I worked for them and was part of their family for many years I appointed you to go bear fruit relationship is fruit and then he says something that kind of is problematic, so that the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. So right now I could ask for um, a Ford Bronco. I'd like to have one, Gordon, amen? Ford Bronco. You think the Lord's going to give me one? No. But when I pray in accordance with the will of the Lord, when I say, okay, Lord, what is your will for my life? What is your will for our parish? Then the Lord will answer accordingly. And so we pray in accordance with the will of the Lord. When we ask in accordance with the will of God as revealed in Jesus, then our love demonstrated toward others will be genuine and not self-serving. We will become witnesses for Jesus in love. So I promised that the last Easter character would be the centurion, and I think it fits in well with today's text because in Matthew 27, verse 54, all of these things were happening in Jerusalem. Earthquakes, the sun got dark. Jesus said, into your hands, Lord, I commend my spirit. And the centurion said, 
truly, truly, this was the Son of God. And I saw something in Matthew 27, verse 54, that I challenge you to look at a little bit later today, at least in the translation I was looking with. It said, and the centurion and others with him said, truly, truly, this is the Son of God. So there were people there that realized, wow, I think we just saw the Son of God on a cross. So who is the centurion? Well, he was responsible for a hundred soldiers. We get the word centurion from that word uh, in Latin, century, 100. He had a lot of responsibility. That would be comparable today. Cooper knows this because he's uh, in ROTC or whatever it is they call it in college. Is it ROTC? Yeah, he'll be a second lieutenant fairly soon. Amen? Looking forward to it. Rides in helicopters. My hero. The centurion would be in charge of what we would call a company today in the United States Army or a small battalion. And even though he was responsible for so many things, he was what we would call a lower social strata type of person, but he would rub elbows with important people. The centurion may have been one of those who supervised or oversaw the crucifixion of Jesus, but we don't know that. The text doesn't tell us that. He may have just been there by happenstance, a witness. But that's the important word, witness. One verse of scripture. He represents the non-Jewish Gentile world that we're a part of. He represents us and any who believe in Jesus. He was a witness by his profession of faith. Truly, truly, this is the Son of God. Along with the others who I think said the same thing. So we're called to be witnesses. We're called to be those who witness the love of Jesus. I can't think of a better witness than the women in our lives. Amen? The women in our lives who kept us in church when we wanted to be somewhere else. I had those women in my family. My uh, grandmother was a Sunday school teacher. And when I was a wee lad, even before I was eligible to be in her second grade class, I wanted to be with her because she taught me the mighty things of God. And even if a teacher is a guy, it's a good thing, right? It's a really good thing. I saw, as I was mentioning to some of our friends and parishioners a little earlier, I saw one of my former confirmands at a memorial service yesterday. And uh, he and my son Mark were born the same week in June of 1986. And I still got a big hug from a 35-year-old man with three kids. Amen? A wonderful thing to be a teacher. And so, you got to love the matriarchs who have shaped our lives, whether they were our mothers, grandmothers, aunts, or just those women who took us by the hand and taught us the things of God. Some of you have probably heard some of these before. My mother is the one who taught me religion. She used to say things like, you better pray that that comes out of the carpet. I had a mom like that. My mom was pretty strict. And one time she uh, kind of switched me with a ruler that must have been one that I had fiddled with in school, and it broke. And my mom was really sad afterward. But I can tell you, I probably deserved it. Amen? My mom taught me medicine. If you don't stop crossing your eyes, they'll freeze that way. My mom taught me how to be a contortionist. Will you look at the dirt on the back of your neck? My mother taught me to appreciate a job well done. If you're going to kill each other, would you and your sister do it outside? I just finished cleaning. And this one is really true in my case. My mother taught me about genetics. She said, you are just like your father. Amen to that. My mother taught me logic because I said so. That's why. You've probably heard that. Many of us have heard that. But the article from 2009 goes on to say, I don't know if any of you had mothers like that. Maybe we all had a mother like that. But here's a more profound question. Do you know anyone whose mother prays for them daily? Yes. Several of you are in that category. A lot of you women within the hearing of my voice are in that category. Let me tell you about a young woman who became one of the most important women in history of the church simply because of her faithfulness as a mom who prayed. Her name was Monica. Some of you recognize that name and 
you already know who I'm talking about. Monica was born in 331 AD in North Africa in what is now Algeria. As a young girl, Monica converted to Christianity, still a relatively new faith. Her parents, who were not religious and not in sympathy with her new faith, married her off to a Roman pagan named Patricius. Both Patricius and his mother who lived with them were hot-tempered people, difficult to deal with. Nevertheless, Monica did her best to be a good wife and a daughter-in-law. While Monica's prayers and Christian deeds bothered Patricius, he respected her belief, and not long before his death, both he and his mother converted to Christianity. I suspect that he probably, she probably never said anything to him about the faith, but she exemplified it by her love. And so, he became a Christian before he died, and a mother-in-law, both hot-tempered. Monica and Patricius had three children, two of whom entered religious life as young adults, and the third was a son named Augustine. Augustine was more of a challenge. By his own admission, he was a wayward youth giving in to most of the pleasures of his day. One writer describes him as lazy and uncouth, but Monica kept praying for her son, and St. Augustine became one of the greatest theologians of the Western Church. We still read his work today. People like Martin Luther, John Wesley were deeply influenced by the writings of St. Augustine, who emphasized the fact that we don't have to earn God's love, all we have to do is receive it. You remember that old commercial, the iced tea commercial, where they took the nest tea plunge, and they'd fall backwards and think, wow, that guy's going to land on the dirt, and he'd land in the water. To me, that illustrated what faith is, trusting that the Lord will receive me. As I say, receive me, Lord. I was a wayward youth. I deserved to be switched with a uh, ruler that was probably breaking. I was a wayward youth. I could tell you a lot of stories, but I don't want to give the, the evil one any glory. Amen? So, just know that it's a good thing when we have moms and grandmas and aunts and uncles and surrogate moms to pull us back on the straight and the narrow. Christina Tomlin wrote this, and I was going to share this at the beginning, but I think that she's a great example of a witness. You know, Christina has always said that her favorite season is Easter, not Christmas. You probably heard her say that before. And uh, she was married. I think her mom's probably still out there in Wisconsin. And she wrote this. She had brought her fiancé uh, here, I think, back around Christmas time. June and I would like to thank you as well as our family at St. John's. It's been a roller coaster of emotions. But we are so blessed and thankful for everyone's prayers and well wishes. We have grown so close together as a couple, but more importantly, even closer to Jesus as a couple. We are blessed, beyond blessed, for everyone's love and support. Jude, and this is the important part, listen to this well. Jude says he understands why I love going to church and why I call the members of St. John's my family. He saw something when he was here. More importantly, he saw something in her. We have enjoyed our first week as husband and wife. We cannot wait to see what else God has for us as we walk this journey together. Thank you again for the prayers and for everyone's love for us, for Jude and our family. Jude and I continue to watch the services on YouTube. Amen, Ron? We watch the services on YouTube, so thank you for posting the services. God bless and all of our love, Christina and Jude, sent to me yesterday, May 8th. We honored a great matriarch this week on Thursday, Ruth Myers. Sarah was there. And uh, I kind of ad-libbed what Sarah had said, but uh, Sarah's a good witness, even at an early age, because she had a great mentor in her Sunday school teacher. And so Linda Poet, her grandmother, wrote this, Hi, I just wanted to share Sarah's sentiments when she heard of Ruth's passing. Sarah had a special bond with Miss Ruth, as she called her. Sarah asked what had happened to Ruth, and I told her, remember the cancer that she had for many years. It just got too bad. Sarah then said, I hope she's having fun up there. And I told her, I'm sure she is. She has her hair back, feels good, and can eat whatever she wants. And Sarah said, Amen. Such deep thoughts from such 
a young mind and heart. Please extend our deepest condolences to the family. So I want to give this to you, Ralph, because who knows the countless other people that Ruth ministered to. Amen? And so we have the witness of one young lady over here whose life was transformed by a Sunday school teacher. I didn't want to embarrass you there, Sarah, but I had to, had to share that. Amen? All good. One of my funeral director friends last uh, Saturday, a week ago, gave me this. It's called A Parable for Mothers. The young mother set her foot on the path of life. Is the way long, she asked. God said, yes, and the way will be dark, hard. You will be old before you reach the end of it, but the end will be better than the beginning. But the young mother was happy, and she would not believe that anything could be better than those years. So she played with her children. She gathered flowers for them along the way and bathed them in the clear streams. And the sun shone on them, and the young mother said, Nothing will ever be lovelier than this. And then the night came, and the storm, and the path was dark, and the children shook with fear and cold, and the mother drew them close and covered them with her mantle. And the children said, Mother, we are not afraid, for you are near, and no harm can come. And the morning came, and there was a hill ahead, and the children climbed and grew weary, and the mother was weary. But at all times she said to the children, A little patience, and we have, and we are there. So the children climbed, and when they reached the top, they said, Mother, we would not have done it without you. And the mother, when she lay down at night, looked up at the stars and said, This is a better day than the last, for my children have learned fortitude in the face of hardness. Yesterday I gave them courage, and today I have given them strength. And the next day came in strange clouds which darkened the earth, clouds of war and hate and evil. And the children groped and stumbled, and the mother said, Look up. Lift your eyes to the light. And the children looked and saw above the clouds an everlasting glory. And it guided them beyond the darkness. And that night the mother said, This is the best day of all, for today I have shown my children God. And the days went on, and the weeks, and the months, and the years, and the mother grew old. And she was little and bent, but her children were tall and strong and walked with courage. And when the way was rough, they lifted her, for she was as light as a feather. And at last they came to a hill, and beyond that they could see a shining road and golden gates flung wide. And the mother said, I've reached the end of my journey, and now I know the end is better than the beginning, for my children can walk alone, and their children after them. And the children said, You will always walk with us, mother, and when you have gone through the gates, even when you have gone through the gates, and they stood and they watched her as she went on alone. And the gates closed after her and they said, We cannot see her, but she is still with us. A mother like ours is more than a memory. She is a living presence, temple, daily. And for those of you who've had to say goodbye to your mentor mothers, your actual mothers, whoever they were, just remember this. They're still right here, amen? And when you miss them the most, they will whisper words in your heart, inspired by the ones who inspired them, so that every single one of us might inspire others. May we sing our next hymn. Please rise as you're able.
May we share together the Apostles' Creed as you'll find printed in our bulletin this morning. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. May we remain in a posture of prayer. Heavenly Father, we lift up before you those who stand in need of any touch from you, all who suffer in any way. We think of Kyle Weedmeyer, who has a dislocated shoulder now, Lord. We pray for his speedy healing, Lord. We pray for Eric Khan's mother, Pat's mother-in-law, Judith, age 90 and one-half, who's entering into hospice, Lord. We pray that those who, in anticipation, are already grieving, Lord, including daughter, granddaughter Laura, that you would comfort their hearts greatly. Comfort, Lord, all who mourn in this hour, Lord, in your mercy. And we pray, Lord, that you would raise us up to be witnesses, not necessarily by what we say, but who we are and whose we are. Give us the opportunity, love, Lord, to express unconditional love to those who are looking for that, who may never have received it up until the time that maybe our paths will have crossed, Lord, in your mercy. And there may be others, Lord, that we want to mention before your throne of mercy in this hour. And we pray for ourselves too, Lord, that in time to come, before our lives are concluded, there will be people that will look back and say, that individual made a difference in my life. Lord, we pray for ourselves that you'd meet us each today at the point of our need. Lord, in your, in your mercy. And into your hands now, Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Amen. As we prepare now for a time of sharing literally the presence of God as he comes to us as he promised. He promised that we would see him visibly in water, water of baptism, and that we would see him in the sign of his presence receiving bread and wine. And so may we pray together as we prepare our hearts to the Lord's Prayer. Please pray. Please pray with me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. May we meditate on the presence of our Lord as we prepare these elements for distribution. Sisters and brothers, in the night in which our Lord Jesus Christ was betrayed, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it for every disciple to eat, saying, This is my body given for you. Take and eat and do so for the remembrance of me. And then again after supper, when he had given thanks, he gave them each the cup to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. As often as we eat the bread and drink from the cup, we proclaim the resurrection power 
of our Lord Jesus Christ coming into our lives even now. Heaven breaking into the here and the now in anticipation of what will be. All things are prepared and we invite all to the table who wish to partake of the presence of the Lord. Amen. Please rise as you're able. And now may the body and the precious blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, may it comfort, strengthen, and keep each of us in God's grace. Amen. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, you've raised us up each to be witnesses in whatever personal way we can do that. And we pray, Lord, that we would look for opportunities to reach out in that unconditional love that you spoke about, Lord Jesus, when you were preparing your disciples for your home going even as God has prepared you, Lord Jesus, be with us in the resuscitated parts of our hearts, in the lives that we live now as we press forward, being your representatives, your ambassadors for Jesus, in whose name we pray. And all of God's people join in saying, Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon each of you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon us all as he blesses us in our lives and in our outreach. Through Jesus our Lord, amen. May we rejoice as we sing our concluding hymn.
In a step of faith, I'm going to start greeting people again, for those who aren't afraid of me. So uh, go in peace to serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.